the things that stand in the way of curiosity, the two big enemies are certainty and fear. Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. Welcome back to the Exploring Washington State podcast. My guest today is Monica Guzman. Monica is many things. And I was, how did I, how was I introduced to you, Monica? But let's just totally just throw this off the rails. I think, did your publicist reach out and say, Monica has a book and you should talk? Let's just go with that. That sounds plausible, right? I have no idea. Yeah, I think it was. Your, I think I think it was your publicist. Let's just okay. Well, we'll we'll go with it. We'll depends how this goes. We can either give them the credit or exactly. blame one I or like one that. of the two. Okay. So, Monica, your your new book it, it's out, correct? Yes. Okay, and it's called "I Never Thought of It." Well, I'm going to butcher the title because I'm reading, but I never thought of it that way. Mm-hmm. How to have fearless, curious conversations, fearlessly curious. It's two adverbs in the subhead. I know it's a mouthful. Yeah. You can do it though. Okay. Starting over. This is all <laughs> going to be recorded for everyone's, but I never thought of it that way. How to have fearlessly curious conversations in dangerously divided times. That's it. That's a mouthful. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. <laughs> but, but man, I remember, uh, I remember debating that, that subhead and trying to take out some words, but also recognizing that you know, in, in today's Amazon and search engine world, uh, detail is good. And so apparently subheads in books are getting longer because of the okay. internet and because of digital search. So we really needed each one of those words to get okay. across the meaning. So you've written the book, but you're also a director of digital and storytelling at Braver Angels. Mm-hmm. And you do the, you're the host of the Crosscut interview series at the Northwest Newsmakers. I know I'm leaving something out. I know, but we're going to come draw all that. <laughs> you live in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Get me up to speed. <laughs> okay. What was so? You grew up. Tell us. Tell me a little bit about your your backstory first off, and and your journey to Seattle. How's that? Because we're all about Washington yeah. State. Yeah. So I was born in Monterrey, Nuevo León, Mexico. So Mexico. Uh, an estate toward the north, a very business-centric city, large city, but not one that many people spend their spring breaks in. And uh, when I was about uh, five, six years old, my dad, my dad's work transferred him to Dallas, Texas. And so that's when our family moved to the States. Uh, and then maybe a year later, the company moved him again, this time to their plant and their office in Dover, New Hampshire. So I spent basically my whole childhood in, yeah, just like a small seacoasty type, seacoast proximate town Mm -hmm. uh, in Dover, in Dover, 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 New Hampshire. And then I went to college in Maine, about an hour and a half away, you know, not too far. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really got along pretty well with my family. I didn't want to go too far. And um, then decided to try the journalism thing. And right out of college, I got this really fantastic fellowship. It was kind of a miracle that I got it, but I did. And it was with the Hearst Newspapers Corporation. All right. And so what they did was they took college graduates on a two-year adventure where they would spend eight months each reporting at three of their newspapers. So I was a cops reporter at the Houston Chronicle first, I was an education reporter at a small paper in Midland, Michigan. And then I was like a new experiment in blogging and technology reporting at the Seattle Post-Intelligencer. So that is how I arrived in Seattle. And then uh, coming out of that fellowship, I had offers from the San Antonio Express News, another Hearst paper, and the Seattle Post-Intelligencer. And I knew that I needed to stay. Uh, I had to stay in Seattle. Just something about the Northwest, how it contrasted with the Northeast, the creativity that I saw everywhere, not just in the tech space, but everywhere. 
really called to me. Uh, I was very sort of achievement oriented at the time. And I loved that people just had good ideas and then went and did them, even if they didn't know it would work. That was so new to me and very compelling. Uh, and then, yeah, I like to think that it really rubbed off on me in some ways. And I became sort of more creative and entrepreneurial myself. That's actually very cool. The fact though, that you, you grew up in, in Mexico, little time in Dallas, Northeast, but then the fellowships take you to back, back to Houston, but to somewhere in Michigan, I have no clue where that's at. What was, what was this? Where's this town at? So Michiganders, that's what they call themselves. Uh, like to hold up a hand to okay. represent the state. Okay. And Midland is literally like you just hold up a hand and you point right to the middle of the pond and that's okay. Midland. All right. And then you, you got to do your time in Seattle and, and then you, for some reason, well, for many reasons, but Seattle's stuck. That, that, that's become, oh, yeah. yeah, that's become home. Let's, we're going to bounce around a lot because I just can't, I cannot think linear, I can't think. <laughs> Good, it's more fun. Okay. When did you get the inspiration to write the book? So it was less one moment and more lots of little moments. Okay. One of the big scenes in my mind is after the 2016 election, going to get togethers and networking events and just, you know, hanging out with groups of people. Mm -hmm. Most of them liberal, Democrat, like myself, by far most of them. <laughs> and uh, hearing a pattern repeat itself where someone would bring up politics because it was a very anxious time. Lots of people here were very worried about the country and about, you know, the person that had just been elected president. Mm -hmm. And someone would mention some scary headline. And everyone would, ah, you know, <laughs> kind of rant about it together. And then often the conversation would turn to the people to blame. And I'm putting air quotes around that. To pe the people to blame would be the people who voted for Donald mm -hmm. Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, of course, assuming that no one in this room would have done something like that, right? Right. But the thing is, my parents voted for Trump. And I love my parents dearly. You know, and I, at the time they lived here and I saw them every weekend. And, and so I would hear people say things about Trump voters that were just not true. They were just not true. You know, forget that they were unkind and stereotyping and vilifying. They were also just wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and what I wanted to do was download my experience with my parents into <laughs> the minds of some folks, just to complicate the idea. And the way that I ended up, uh, well, not doing that all the way, but at least trying to, was to, to basically say in those conversations, well, my parents are Mexican immigrants who voted for Trump. And because that was surprising, that someone with that identity would vote for Trump, especially to people in very liberal Seattle who are not exposed to a lot of diversity of political thought, it would stop conversation. And <laughs> then I would find myself really hoping that people would ask me, why? Why did your parents vote for Trump? And if they did, I was really delighted because it gave me an opportunity to help them see what I see, mm -hmm. um, which is that people are very complicated and they might have reasons that you don't expect. Um, so that was a huge personal reason. Um, n knowing that there was, some, there was some bridge I had here that others maybe didn't, mm -hmm. but... It wasn't just that. It was also my journalism career. Having been in the business of having conversations of understanding without judgment. To me, that's what good journalism ultimately is. Very curious. Mm -hmm. And you want to know why people do what they do. And you want to sit with them and absorb something about the meaning of that for them. And then you want to have a chance at be able, being able to transfer that story to a very large audience in the hopes that what you're doing is connecting a community to itself and making sure that a society sees and understands itself. And so I took that very seriously. Uh, and after the 2016 election, it just started to become really clear to me that at the foundational level, the glue between people was really dissolving and fraying uh, in a way that made us look across big divides 
and see monsters who weren't there, see gross exaggerations. The social science research shows us this is true. And it's not that there aren't lots of things to be concerned about or that there aren't really big disagreements, but there are so many exaggerations and they are keeping us from being creative, uh, which is something I've always valued Seattle for. We're creative, but not when we're this scared. And do we want to be scared when it may not be justified? Okay. I would like to ask the question, why did your parents vote for Donald Trump? Yeah. So to, uh, to keep it, you know, shorter than an hour long conversation for my mom, the number one issue is abortion. Okay. My mom started the right to life club at my Catholic high school in New Hampshire. And she was so devoted to it. She also volunteered at a clinic that counseled women who had had abortions or who were thinking about having abortions from the Catholic perspective. Uh, she would come home. I remember her coming home from some shifts at that clinic, like devastated, carrying the stories of, of women and the tensions and the conflicts, uh, devastated, I'm crying at home on our kitchen table. Um, so for her, there's, there's no devil you could put on the other side of the devil that would kill babies like that. That's how she sees it. Okay. And then for my dad, uh, there's a couple things that I can talk about. But um, but one of the ones that comes to mind is, you know, he's he's one of many people who looked at the government and politics in America and just saw it as smarmy and false and a lot of posturing and not a lot of actual real talk, not a lot of people saying what they mean, but just saying what people think, you know, what they think people want to hear. And it just added up to a lot of. Eh, th this is obviously not working. It's just so ridiculous. And what is, what's it going to take to change things? And so one of the things he and I have talked about is, you know, Trump in a way was, seemed to him like, well, let's shake this up. Okay. Let's shake this up. Here's a guy who says what he means. Uh, he happens to agree with a lot of my politics for him. Mm -hmm. uh, and somehow he's getting popular enough to be on this ticket. So my dad was actually, you know, excited about him even in the primary. Because, because while everyone else was doing their posturing the way he saw it, the typical political posturing, here's a guy that's not afraid to break the rules on behalf of the people. That's okay. how he saw it. Okay. And so you've, you've had discussions with your parents, obviously, mm -hmm. and you don't, you agree to disagree. Maybe that's a polite way of saying it. And then when you're at a, social event in Seattle and you bring up that your parents voted for Trump. Um, you can maybe I'm paraphrasing, but maybe feel the oxygen, leave the room mm -hmm. <laughs> people. Ah. So when, when people started, when they asked you why your parents voted for Trump and you started explaining probably very similarly to how you just shared with us here, what did people say? How did people react to that? Yeah. I mean, often they would ask more questions, which is great when it would keep the conversation going. You know, I didn't want to just make it a talking point and move on. Um, and they would also often volunteer information about people in their own lives who might have voted for Trump or it would make them think about who they knew or sometimes the fact that they didn't know anyone who had. Mm -hmm. uh, or they would share they would try to explain their surprise. Um, you know, they, yeah, just, just whatever would come up, whatever would bubble up for them. And it really was very different. But um, all I hoped for was that it would, that it was honest. And it always was. For the most part, if somebody asked why it would happen, not in a big group, but, you know, off to the side, maybe a little bit later. So I heard, you know, what you said about your parents. I'm super like interested. What, what's that about? Um, or, or they might not even ask me a question, but would say, I saw what you said about your parents. Uh, you know, my cousins also in Ohio or whatever, you know, vo voted for Trump. And, and then they would tell me it's been really hard or, you know, I've tried to talk with them. And then we would make the conversation about that more, more, what is the relationship like? So now that I think about it, it wasn't just, okay, let's, let's think about, let's talk about the content of their vote and the contrast and how, what it makes me think of. It was also sometimes a conversation about, wait a minute, you, you get along with them? You talk with them? 
Tell me about that. Okay. So then the, the idea of the book started to percolate. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a long percolation percolation <laughs> at the okay. time in 2017, I was extremely busy with the newsletter that I founded in Seattle, the Evergrey. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's a community <laughs> as well. We did a lot of stuff. I love the name. I love the Evergrey. Uh, are, are you familiar with the needling? The needling. Oh yeah. 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 Seattle's version of the onion, if you will. Yeah. 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 When I, when I saw the Evergrey, I thought that was a I thought that was like an onion esque title to be honest yes. with you. I just okay. Oh my gosh, yes. So so you were doing the Evergrey and this is just in your subconscious, if you will, just percolating. It just I'm, kept a coffee, up. I'm a coffee fan. Everything's got a reference to coffee. <laughs> Let's uh, so there was, you, you said it wasn't one big idea. It was a lot of little things that kind of mm -hmm. added up to become, you know, this, this, how did you go about, cause I, I don't, I don't know the publishing industry very well. So I'm always curious about how, like, how do you take this idea mm. and how do you present it to someone, a publisher? Yeah. So when you brought that, so what you decide, I'll just flash forward and say, you decided I'm going to write a book. Did you start writing the book or did you start shopping the idea of the book? Mm. I I started a Slack channel. I don't know if you're familiar with that app, I, I, Slack. I, that was I'm going to tease you. I'm, I'm old, yeah. but I'm not that old. Come okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people are like, no Slack, all email, yeah. forever. Well, well I, but, I'm know. kind of there. I'll be honest with you, but I, yeah. I, am, I know Slack. I've used it. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Well, that was the first step. It just felt like, man, someday I got to write about this. Let me start collecting my thoughts because there's always something. Okay. And so I did that and I just started a little channel for myself where I would just drop notes. And okay. I did that for months. And then a publisher actually contacted me in a really roundabout way. But, but it was, a, it was a, a, an imprint of a publisher and it was a friend of mine who worked there asking if I'd ever be interested in writing a book, you know, kind of in their cotter of, of potential authors, uh, but, it, but in a very different way, not in the typical way. And so what I told him was like, you know, it's funny you mention it. I have this idea. And um, one thing led to another and it, it ended up resulting in just, okay, here's the forcing function for write up an outline, make a kind of book proposal. Um, then I got an agent, you know, then I shopped it around and I found my publisher and there we go. So okay. it was sort of a roundabout way. It wasn't, it wasn't like the straight start from zero thing where you kind of have to build it from scratch. I, I ended up having someone kind of reaching out going, oh yeah, like that, that sounds like a good idea. Let me give you a little, a little bit of a leg up there. Okay. How long did it take? What? Share with us some of the things you learned during your writing of the book, during the conversations that you've had, the research that you've done. What are some of the aha moments you might have encountered that you weren't expecting? About the process of writing a book or about well, the content of what I was writing? Both. I mean, you, let me ask you, let, let me just, I'll tease you. Okay. The book was super easy to write. You just sat down, typed okay. it out. Sure. It, no spelling, no no grammatical errors. I mean, it was easy. We're done in an oh afternoon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the the process of writing. Was this your first published book? Yes. Okay. Did okay. I don't remember if this was on camera, so to speak. You mentioned when you were a young child, snow in Mexico. Yeah. And you thought it was clouds, and you were disappointed that it was cold and wet because you had yeah. this conceived preconceived notion. Did you have any preconceived notions mm. about writing a book? that yeah. the reality was different. Yeah. Well, having been a writer my whole career, I was not new to the idea of writing a book. I've known some authors. Uh, I was terrified of it because I knew rationally this should and probably will be the hardest thing I've ever done. Okay. That So I expected that and that was true. <laughs> okay. okay. So that was okay, right? But expecting something doesn't mean that you're ready for it. Um, oh, that no, is not the same so, thing. I know that so, so right now. <laughs> uh, the real, the real big challenge, honestly, was the pandemic. I okay. signed my book deal 
the day that Wall Street crashed in 2020, in March. So I had visions of writing my book in coffee shops, you know, having lunch with friends in between shifts. None of that <laughs> happened. So I'm, I'm a pretty extroverted person. I get a lot of energy from people. And I imagined that that's what this would look like, you know? I even thought I would travel around and, you know, talk with some of the people more closely that I wanted to, to write about or whatever. So all that was dashed. But at the same time, now that I look back on it, a kind of silver lining to that in a really messed up way is that the pandemic put us all into a forced, unwilling social experiment in what happens when you don't have good, engaged conversations with people. What happens when you are so distant from people? Social distance mm -hmm. is the problem. <laughs> you know, social oh, distance right. is the problem. And then it became medically necessary. So that ended up, I think, providing a contrast that I didn't expect and that I think might have helped okay. me articulate and, you know, viscerally experience what I'm trying to get people not to want. Okay. All right. How about during your research and conversations? What were some of the, did you have any eureka or aha moments that you weren't expecting? I mean. Yeah. Um, I mean, all kinds of things. The title of the book, I never thought of it that way. That came before the book deal. When I thought what I was working on was an event series. I was okay. thinking about doing an, a Seattle event series that uh, where people would go up and do talks answering the question, how I came to believe X or Y or Z. Mm -hmm. And that it wouldn't be a series of arguments or opinions. It would be a story about how people came to believe some surprising thing that doesn't fit the typical Seattle narrative. And that's what I thought I was working on. And in the, at the front of the binder where I had my notes, uh, I, had, I had the phrase, I never thought of it that way. And I actually met with Tim Burgess, who is a longtime Seattle City Council member and, um, and mayor for a little while uh, during a very tumultuous uh, transitions of mayors. But, um, but I was meeting with him uh, through a fellowship program that I did. And, and he just thought that title was so powerful that there is something about when you think or say, I never thought of it that way. So he gave me this sort of validation of something that I was already thinking, which is this might be the goal that, that maybe if, if we become a more curious culture that can talk more openly, honestly, and candidly about things that matter in a way that help us understand each other. One of the signals we would have is that more of us are going, Hmm, I never thought of it that way. Hmm. I never thought of it that way. And, uh, okay. That was a really cool Eureka moment. That's when I was like, that's the title. Okay. <laughs> that's it. No, it's that a was a great really cool. title. And that stuck. Yeah, that stuck all the way through. I figured the publisher would be like, no, you need something more X, Y, or Z. No, they loved it. Everybody loved it. Um, so that was cool. Uh, yeah, and what else? Man, I remember um, <laughs> this was fun. So the part one of the book, there's five parts. And only part one deals with how we got here. The problem of polarization. Right? Only part one. Four-fifths of the book is solutions, everybody. Four-fifths. <laughs> anyway, but that first fifth, uh, I was talking about, I was trying to figure out the outline of this, the structure of this was by far the hardest thing. It took okay. months. It took a lot of time. And um, But I eventually kind of came down to this idea that, well, you know, for me, it's about sorting, othering, and siloing. In the researching that, research that I'm doing, we're sorting ourselves to be around people that we like. This is a very normal human thing that we're doing. Fine, but there's a dark side. Let's explore it. We other, you know, we put distance between ourselves and people who are different. The difference doesn't even have to be meaningful for us to discriminate against the other. But when it is meaningful, whoa, watch out. We start doing some pretty awful stuff. And then siloing, which is, you know, the stories we tell and the stories we hear and are amplified to us. Uh, as a result of the distance we put between us and who are different and people who are different and the ways that technology lets us like pick our neighbors digitally and all that that does to what stimulates our thinking. And then it was my agent, Matt Belford, who looked at that and was like, sorting, othering, and siloing. Why don't you just say that's an SOS? And I was like, it's an SOS. 
yes, hey. <laughs> and so that, you know, it was like moments like that that helped me really gain confidence in the structure and that that I was, you know, doing something kind of, it was working. Uh, all the chapter titles are just one word. And I spent a lot of time sometimes trying to come up with like, what is the essence of what I'm saying here? And so that was maybe the most fun is that as, as complicated as writing is, as many words as I wrote and threw away, it was one of the most pleasurable things to see like the nugget of gold in the middle of a big mess and to sculpt away from something and be like, this is what I'm really talking about, this one thing. Okay. And then go through and kind of make sure that everything is really just complementing that one thing uh, was really fun. Let me ask you this question. Sculpted away to get to the one thing, the nugget that you think the chapter is about. When you handed it to your editor, did they agree with you? Okay. Yeah, for the most part, which was cool. Okay. Um, let me let me remember. There was I remember there was a chapter I had uh, that might have been titled "Fear" or might have been titled "Courage." Okay. I I really thought for a long time that we needed a whole chapter on that because. The things that stand in the way of curiosity, the two big enemies are certainty and fear. Mm -hmm. And so what is what then is courage? And I had a whole chapter on that that was really tough to let go of. But eventually I got to the point where I really could see with my editor's help that it I didn't need it. And it was already woven through the rest of it. So that was one. That was one where it was like after the first draft came back, you know, there were some notes from her going, I don't know. I don't know how this one. What's this? Uh, and you know, as a writer, of course, you pour your you pour everything into what you write. But I was never that confident of a writer. I know I'm really I was so eager for honest feedback. So it was really good. As soon as I saw the signals that some sections aren't working, I'm like, okay, cool. Like it's gone. Help help me see. I needed other people to help me see what the vein of everything really was. Okay. So how long from Writing the outline to publishing. How long? Mm, oh, to publishing, two years. Two years. Yeah. How long from, because that's probably, that's not fair on you. How long from writing the outline to the final copy? Uh, before the publisher oh. takes it and goes and does their part of the, you know, the, the business. The final part of it, draft was last, late last summer. Okay. Right? I think so. It's all so it's blur. <laughs> it's all blur. It's interesting to me because a couple of authors that I've chatted with, the one thing that seems surprising to me is the amount of time it takes from the final draft to being on the shelf. Yeah, like, yeah. It's, no, it's a it, there's a lot of things can happen in the world Yeah. from the day the final draft is done to the day that it's on yeah. Barnes & Noble shelf or wherever you buy third place books or... Yep. Elliott Bay Books or Amazon, wherever. Yep. What was it like the day it went for sale? Oh, yeah. I was really overwhelmed. Uh, and I was overwhelmed actually because of something that happened the day before. Oh. So the day before, the New York Times reviewed it. Oh. That's a big deal <laughs> in the publishing That's a really world. really big deal. And, and we had heard, the publisher had heard that the New York Times had assigned it for review, but we had no idea when it would run. And for all we knew, it could have been weeks after publication. We weren't sure. Right. But it came out the day before publication. And it just, it's like a good punch. It just gave me like a good punch. It was a good review. It was a good review. Uh, but, okay. I was, but I was like knocked sideways. Uh, so by the... <laughs> And suddenly it was like, pfft, you know, and all these people who wouldn't have heard of it otherwise heard, were hearing of it and I was getting all this incoming. Uh, it was wonderful. The night of launch day, March 8th, that Tuesday, I had this big launch party at my house. Okay. And that was super cool. Um, and I was, but again, I was just, I was overwhelmed. I feel like I needed, I, I needed every, I needed time to stop so I could just catch up, you know, right. and then keep going. But, uh, but instead what happened is like, no, time barreled on. And I, I had um, a bunch of events lined up, you know, for the book tour. And so there we went, you know, the next day was uh, a talk at Third Place Books and then all these virtual events. And then I went to DC and I went to San Francisco and Sacramento and Philadelphia and New York. 
Um, next week, I'm going back to D.C. and then to Florida. Uh, and then it'll be Minneapolis and Cincinnati. And so there's just, I didn't realize when I was setting up all these events that I was setting up all these events. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, whoa. <laughs> so it's been, but I, but I, maybe you can tell from, you know, the look on my face. It's been fun. So fun. And that I'm day was fun. That. Yeah. And when I saw, I remember the night of March 9th. So the day after it came out was the first time that I saw it at a bookstore at third place books, my favorite bookstore. I love it. And my, I, I took a little video and my hand was shaking on the video. I didn't post it. It was so shaky. Uh, you know, that was cool. I, I can only imagine that it, it has to be a very surreal experience yeah. to see a book or whatever. It could be a product that you've been working on and, you know, um, whatever it might be, but a book, especially because to me, books are very, they're very tangible. They're, I think I may, this is just my interpretation. I think more thought blood, sweat and tears goes into a book than yeah. maybe, maybe my iPad did yeah. when they designed it, which isn't true. I know that logically, but, but my thought is, is that an author is slaving away in a yeah. coffee shop and, staring at a blank page and writing something and crumpling it up. And I know you probably didn't even use paper, but you know, the idea of, you yeah, know, writing it and throwing it away and, and to get it finally released. Yeah. And honestly, I don't know that you could have asked for a better press than a New York times review oh, the day before. I mean, you couldn't have insane. paid for that. I know. You couldn't have paid, you couldn't have paid for better press. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah that's, that's, yeah, that's, and you know, it's a small publisher and I'm I'm a first-time author. It wasn't exactly in the cards. So, yeah, really always trying to kind of stay grateful for everything. I'm one of those people who's always looking for the next thing, the next thing, and sometimes I have to remind yeah. myself, dude, celebrate, <laughs> you know? Oh. Like <laughs> Well, I was this just going to awesome. move on. I was just going to move on and come back to the book. So, we're going to thank you for saying that cuz we're going to stop. Mm -hmm. So, so you mentioned there's only one chapter on the problem and there's chapters on the solution solutions mm -hmm. give me give the audience a, a, a real high level we want them to read the book okay i mean we do we want them to read the book i think it's vitally important that this book be read and not just read but consumed mulled over pondered mm. and not just skimmed mm. so what are so give us the you know the 5,000 foot overview of the book. Yeah. So the first part, as I said, the SOS is about how mm -hmm. we got here, sorting, othering, and siloing. Mm -hmm. And then we go to a part called curiosity. And that one is about looking at some of the ways in which our brain hears information, hears ideas and perspectives that it instinctively agrees with and that it instinctively disagrees with. So it's some awareness about how we are already programmed to repel perspectives that we don't like and how curiosity is a tool that we can aim right at the things we don't understand, that we don't have to wait for it to come along. We can actually deploy it. Uh, curiosity is active when we become aware of a gap between something we know and something we want to know. Okay. Okay. When we manufacture certainty because of stress or tension or anxiety or just we don't have time, we do that a lot, curiosity goes away. And when we are very afraid of other perspectives, curiosity goes away because you can't wonder about something you think is out to get you. If somebody aims a gun at your head, you're not going to be like, what's that? You're going to run. So those two things are tricky. And then we talk about conversation, the power of conversation. A lot of us uh, have found our own little ways to avoid it or to accept some trade-offs like being on social media where we can talk to many people at once, but we're not talking to them in a really engaged way where we see the whole person. And so it becomes easier to lose sight of the person behind the ideas, the mystery behind what seems awful and terrible. And we forget that conversation is this incredible context where we do put ourselves on the line 
but so does everyone else. And we become afraid of what we might discover, but actually it's just an incredible place for two different perspectives to build friction and for people to learn from that friction. So I talk about some frameworks about how to make the most of that. And then part three is called people. And I break down three, three ways that we tend to get stuck uh, when we try to talk to each other across disagreement. One is because of our assumptions. Uh, another is because of the unreasonable ways that we use our reason. Uh, and a third is about some of the dysfunctional ways that we hold and share our opinions. So the assumptions chapter is a little bit like certainty. Every time we have assumptions about people, that's manufacturing certainty about them when we don't know them. We have not talked to them. We don't allow them to surprise us. And we, you know, go off and do our own non-curious thing. So I tell a story there about a really life-changing um, trip that I helped organize through the Evergrey, my newsletter, where we, we had uh, 20 people from Seattle visit Sherman County, the second smallest county in Oregon, very agricultural. And it's a county that had voted exactly opposite us in the 2016 presidential election. I tell the story of that and what we learned, uh, which was basically to always be asking, what am I missing? Always be asking, what am I missing? And recognizing that we're in our silos and we don't see all the whole picture. Uh, with reason, oh my gosh, a lot of our conversations get stuck because we're just insisting our, our reasons to each other, expecting the reason that meant everything to me to mean everything to you. And it won't. Because, because what matters is the, the, the ground into which you might plant a reason, right? And each of us is just like, this landscape of complications. And um, so we do that. We, we insist our reasons at each other way too often and it gets really, really bad. And so I, I give some solutions to that. And then finally, opinion uh, is about, we, we tend to conflate people with their opinions. You know, someone's a walking opinion. And of course we feel attacked when someone disagrees with us and we want to attack others when we disagree with them. But I talk about how the radical notion that we don't actually choose our opinions. If we're honest, our opinions arrive at us as a result of our experiences and what we've seen and what we think we know. That's opinions, they arrive. Um, Interesting. And so with that knowledge, you can really, you can take that and apply it to the ways in which we share our opinions to do it more flexibly so that we actually are learning and we're not so afraid that somebody's attacking us when they disagree with us. Uh, and then real quickly, because I'm probably taking too long, part four is paths and... Um, I argue that one of the most incredible ways to understand each other's uh, perspectives and opinions is not to ask why we believe what we believe, but how we came to believe what we believe. And that means that we should pay attention to our experiences and try to unlock those in each other in the form of stories, and that we should pay attention to our values and try to unlock those in each other by asking about each other's concerns beneath issues rather than just what they think of the issue. Uh, and then I have a chapter on what I call attachments and attachments are what hold us to our beliefs and they may not, not always be good. Um, so there's a lot to say about that, that we could go into. And then finally, the last part of the book is called honesty. And it brings up the point that curiosity without honesty or honesty without curiosity doesn't work. doesn't add up to anything. If you're very honest, but you're not open and you don't feel like you can share some of the stuff that's really inside you, then what are we going to learn? Uh, so we talk about clarity, the importance of actually getting other people's meaning clear and getting your own meaning clear and what that looks like in a conversation. Um, and then we talk about openness. What can you do in a conversation to build a context where people feel good thinking out loud a little bit and sharing some of how they walked to their views? Uh, because that's what we're going to need. We're going to need to really open ourselves up to be able to understand each other. I have a question, mm -hmm. just spontaneous question. In the part of your book I read, you share kind of how, and I'm paraphrasing, but you, you said your mom, you were younger, and your mom maybe corrected you because of the grammar you were using, and mm -hmm. you were responding back that you she wasn't hearing you. Is that okay? And I... My initial takeaway also is that you have a very good relationship with your parents. How has your relationship with your parents changed during the process of this book? Mm. Uh, I, 
I mean, it hasn't changed. It's still, I okay. would say it's as close, it's as close as it always was, if not a little bit closer. Okay. Um, my were parents they... actually just left my house this morning. They were here for several days. Uh, okay. They joined me in Washington, D.C. for my uh, bookstore event there and, and another event there. Nice. And that was great because I was able to yeah. say, like, my parents are right here, by the way. Um, yeah, they've been nothing but excited and proud, uh, which is awesome. Um, but has it yeah. helped the way you communicate with their generation? Yes. Because the way I'm, here's yes. my interpretation is that as we get older, for whatever reason, I mean, this is, just, I'm stereotyping everybody here, you know, which is not necessarily what we should be doing, but admittedly this is, as we get older, we seem to get more set in our ways. Yeah. Whether we lose curiosity, whether we just are tired and we can't be bothered, whatever. Yep. And I don't know your parents, never met them. I'm not trying to imply that they are any of those things. Yep. But I, my perception is, is that as we get older, it's a little harder to maybe sit back and listen, understand. I hadn't thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. Maybe a harder phrase as we get older. These solutions, when you try them on with your parents, are they receptive? Yeah. So just yesterday at lunch, we had a really cool conversation about trans issues, gender pronouns, uh, everything that society, the sort of frontiers that society appears to be on when it comes to how we think about gender and Mm -hmm. the concerns on all sides, you know, like Leah Thomas, the, the trans swimmer, you know, who's Mm -hmm. really, you know, pushing people's sort of understanding of of fairness and putting the value Mm -hmm. of fairness on the table and the value of freedom of someone to compete for who they, who they are. Right. into tension with each other. We talked about that. We talked about um, what's, what's called the don't say gay bill in Florida. I think that's how it started. But yeah, I mean, I would say, I think if my mom were here, cause she was the one that was most like engaged in that conversation, she would probably say she uses some of these. The thing is she used the things that I wrote about in the book before I wrote about them, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Like she always says, She always says this, and she said this, you know, well before, but uh, that one of the reasons that that she and I and my dad can have these kinds of conversations is we validate each other's good points. So she makes a point about something, (laughs) and I may not agree with it, but I agree agree it's a good point and that I should consider it. I go, oh, yeah, it's a good point. I say it in Spanish, but same thing. And and it, (laughs) it always feels like, it feels like that builds a kind of base camp okay. up a mountain where, you know, we, we see each other there and now we can climb higher okay. and, and then we see each other in the new place and we can climb higher. And, and okay. that's why we can get so high. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's not a visit I've had with my parents probably, you know, that's at least a couple days where we haven't gotten into it about something in DC. We had a really long and interesting conversation about, um, yeah, like, actually related stuff um like lgbtq kinds of things that was super cool uh and it tied into race as well we got into all that uh okay. so yeah i mean it just seems it's 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 very interesting i i have a lot of questions for them they have a lot of questions for me <laughs> cuz well, i'm 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 the liberal in their life <laughs> who they have other sorry. liberals in their lives but i'm the one I'm the one that they can learn a lot from because we can get to these high places, tough, tricky places and make some headway and cook something with the heat that builds up. Right. And I would say the same about them. Like I, I know a lot of folks who are conservative. I work at Braver Angels. I know a lot of folks who don't share my politics. Um, but you know, my parents, I can ask them, I can just ask them just about anything if I'm concerned about it and get their real take. Uh, for the most part, it's not, necessarily it has to be the right context right um okay. and i talk about what those contexts are in the book okay. but yeah i think you know I, I i hope we continue to do that like the mystery of my parents is not solved and i think the mystery of me <laughs> is not solved to them you know well i don't know if the mystery of anyone is ever solved it's not and that's I, I that's think... the thing of it we we confuse i talk about this in the book we we treat each other as puzzles instead of mysteries uh, which okay. is this lovely distinction that an author named Ian Leslie makes really in a compelling way. 
But when you, when you have a puzzle, all you need is the pieces. And then you just have the pieces. And all you have to do is assemble them in the right way. Easy peasy, right? If you read a thought okay. piece with some statistics, oh, that I get it now. That's a piece. I can just lay that down. I know these people. I know all these people. Here's the puzzle. Here's what I've built. We're done. But that's not how people are at all, you know? And we make that mistake of generalizing and all that all the time. It's, 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 uh, it's sort of, it's, it's a kind of hypocrisy that I see a lot where everybody wants themselves to be seen for who they are and the nuance and intricacies, but we're okay, we're too okay sometimes seeing other people with broad brushstrokes. Why? Why doesn't, why isn't everybody, <laughs> why can't everybody be afforded the dignity of, um, of having space to be nuanced and, and com- complicated? And we start to think that other people are just not that complicated and it's very simple, really. And it's really just this and they're motivated by these horrible things. And in, in some cases, sure, they, they are. But, you know, even a white supremacist can, can change their minds. <laughs> so there's always a person underneath, right? There's a person underneath uh, that you can reach. And talking to that person instead of the idea, it's just a better direction. That's fascinating to me because you say, you know, I, I, want, I want people to, to understand that I'm nuanced, but yet I might think of them as a two-dimensional, you know, yeah. without depth. Yeah. But yet, how dare they not see my depth? Yeah. And, and in... Is that maybe the risk of going down a big rabbit hole here? But and, I, and maybe I'm looking for a scapegoat when I say it this way. But I'll just say it: is that is media somewhat responsible for that? Because we, you know, we tend to like you use siloing. You know, our our I'll say Facebook. Our Facebook yeah. profiles are full of I don't know. You're, are you on Facebook? Yeah. How many friends do you have, approximately, on Facebook? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Probably well, thousands. X. I've been there a long time. Okay, thousands. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And, but they, it, it, it almost it becomes like an echo chamber. Yeah. Like we'll 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 say sports. Sports might be a safer topic. My friends are Seahawks fans. I don't have any Denver Bronco fans. Yeah. So of course, I'm my Seahawks fans. They're nuanced. They're like me, where a Denver Broncos fan is, oh, how dare they? How can they like the Broncos? You know, we oversimplify yeah. other people, but we want to be comp- We want to be taken in our entirety. Yep. And I wonder if media helps us with that unintentionally. I'm not trying to blame the media, but yeah. um, well, maybe I am blaming the media. But, but yeah, the no, blame the that, media. It's absolutely part of the problem. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So let me, let me jump to this question then. If I gave you the magic wand... And you can wave it. Mm-hmm. How would you fix media? Mm. Ugh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been in media a long time, and it's very, it's very difficult for me to answer questions like that. Uh, in part because it's become so complicated for me that okay. even the idea of the media being one thing that you can wave a magic wand at is sort of fraud. Uh, <laughs> you know. Also, also, I don't see. Although we think of media as an institution, and it is in many ways, it also is just us talking to ourselves. It's just okay. us. So I think there's a, there's a temptation to externalize when we blame mm. the media and, um, and just try to remove the ways in which we're implicated in everything the media does. And we know it. We know it. Um, but having worked in media, the, the, the incentives for a media outlet's survival... Uh, push them very hard toward finding a narrow and loyal audience. And right now with how social media works and how emotions drive behavior, you know, we, we see that headlines and other content that make us feel some kind of way, it's going to trigger that, you know, whether it's outrage or fear or concern or, you know, even like a rah, rah, rah kind of joy. Those are the mm-hmm. things that make us want to then share that content, make that content a part of who we are or make it seem that way on our profiles, 
you know, we want to billboard that content. Like, this is it. This is everything I believe. Everyone should read it. And uh, that's only natural. It, we're using the stories the media tells to tell our own mm-hmm. story, right? To try to right. share. It's a, it's a vehicle through which we want to be seen and understood. It's a very imperfect vehicle because it is motivated you know, by outlets who need to survive, who need certain number of clicks, you know, who, like, I didn't blink an eye. I didn't bat an eye every time I wrote a headline knowing that, you know, I'm writing the headline not not with the primary concern of being extraordinarily precise and nuanced, but with the primary concern of making sure this content gets seen. Um, and that's that, that's the incentives. Uh, mm-hmm. So so the waving a magic wand thing is sort of like a nice, it's a nice idea. <laughs> But right, right. <laughs> but all systems are held up by incentives. And in a lot of ways, the media is doing exactly what it's designed to do, you know? Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I, basically where I come down on it is, and the whole reason I wrote the book too is, I just don't think it makes any sense to wait for the media or our politicians to fix any of this. They are working on it uh, systemically, and I know a lot of folks in both those institutions that are pushing boundaries in really strong ways. But okay. the only thing that is going to accelerate changes in those institutions is cultural change at the grassroots level. And that's people themselves taking what they think are very small steps that don't amount to anything in their own conversations. They do amount to something. They do amount to something. Curiosity is contagious. I mean, you model that in your own conversations you make a conversation go from something that could have been really fraught to something that's really fascinating. And whoever you were talking to is going to like it. Not every time. It's really tough. There's a lot of complexity here. But when, you, when every time you manage to do that, even when one little exchange, that catches fire. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just think it also turns the volume down on a lot of things going on in our society. And what would our politics and our media be like if we weren't so afraid of each other? What would it be like? You know, I think it could get us somewhere really, really good. I, I agree with you. And I have thought of it that way. Just to yeah. speak your title. Nice. <laughs> speak title. Let's wrap up about the book. And then I want to ask a couple other topic questions. So the books, where can people find out more about the book? Let's, uh, let's ask answer that question first. Yeah. So they can go to the book's website, reclaimcuriosity.com. Uh, Good title. Or you can go to my social media at Moni Guzman on Twitter or Instagram. And uh, yeah, follow along all the stuff I'm thinking about and talking about when I have the time to actually share it, <laughs> uh, which sometimes is a lot, especially when I'm traveling. Uh, but yeah, that's where you can find the book, reclaimcuriosity.com. It's a great title. Let's transition to Braver Angels. Mm -hmm. Elaborate on that for the audience that might not know about it Mm -hmm. and what's your role and what's its function. Yeah, so Braver Angels is the largest cross-partisan grassroots organization committed to depolarizing America, to bringing liberals and conservatives and everyone in between and everyone above that spectrum together to, in the words of our mission statement, Strengthen our democratic republic. So part of the, you know, the, the founding sort of theory of, of Braver Angels is that our polarization, particularly what is called in the social sciences affective polarization, which is polarization based on how we feel about each other rather than the actual content of our disagreements, that that, that is really weakening our democratic republic. And it's also, you know, challenging our relationships, our lives, uh, it's making things really, really tough on a number of levels. And it's the, the way I think of it is it's the problem that eats all other problems. Um, and it's the monster that convinces us the monsters are us. It's very hard for me to envision, you know, this country moving forward in a really cool, like confident way, uh, unless we, we, we handle some of this, um, and okay. the ways in which we even interact. So Braver Angel is what, um, it's based on marriage therapy, So one of the co-founders is a well-known marriage therapist who applies the techniques of marriage therapy to the divide between red and blue in this country. 
And it's done through these incredible workshops that have been studied and their effect is demonstrated. Uh, and they've been done who knows how many times with how many people at this point. And um, we're even bringing, in, bringing them into the halls of power. So uh, sitting members of Congress and elected officials from state legislatures doing our workshops, um, bringing their, uh, the Braver Angels format of town halls into their communities. Uh, yeah, and we also have um, these really fascinating programs that people can join. And the chief one is, the signature one is our Braver Angels debates, which are these national virtual debates where it's not about who wins, it's about can we engage in a collective search for truth? And, okay. and there's really nothing like a Brave Rangers debate. There's nothing like it. It's awesome. Uh, and so we're kind of showing that it is possible to talk really productively about some of the toughest issues facing our country. Um, we just have to begin with structures that can build trust. Okay. And, That's yeah. awesome. And my role is I'm the the director of digital and storytelling, but uh, okay. but really at Braver Angels, there's people wear a lot of hats, and it's a it's a it's a scrappy, largely volunteer run organization, uh, and it's awesome. It's like an ensemble cast of people who are just like ready for a better way. And not that it really matters, but where is it based out of? Um, the the central office is New York City, but okay. there's not actually that many folks there, so. Uh, okay we're really scattered around the country. One of the co-founders is from South Lebanon, Ohio, um, a okay. small town. So yeah. yeah, I mean, we're, we're all over the place. Yeah. I always love to ask my guests, what do you like to do when you're not doing what you do for your career? What's fun and relaxing for you? Singing. Singing. Yeah. Yeah. What, what type sing genre? What? Uh, I really like to belt it out. <laughs> so, um, what genre? I you you can see it. Your listeners can't. I have a Billy Joel poster above my piano over there. I am a oh. huge fan of soft rock, seventies and eighties, nineties and today. Right? Uh, I grew up with that stuff. Uh, I also really love um, Latin American, like Mexican, sort of all the sort of hits uh, okay. from there. And I sing a lot in Spanish. Uh, my latest obsession has been the Encanto soundtrack. You know the Disney I'm not movie. Familiar. Uh, no, I don't. Oh, it's I, so good. It's okay. so good. The music is fantastic. Uh, okay. So yeah, that's been fun. And the the perk there is I get to sing along with my two kiddos. So. And what do the kids like to do for fun besides sing with mom? Oh, man. Um, so my son, Julian, he's nine. He is a walking tennis encyclopedia. He knows oh. all of the top players. He watches all of the tournaments during his sort of, you know, a couple hours of screen time every weekday. He goes to YouTube and looks up the latest videos from matches, whatever tournament is going on right now. He can tell you who's ranked what and who he's excited <laughs> about all the time. And he takes tennis lessons and he loves tennis. Um, okay. And then my daughter is obsessed with drawing and art. So okay. she just doodles, 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 doodles. And I'll be at my desk and, you know, the times that she interrupts me during a meeting, what's sweet about it is that it's almost always just to hand me a drawing of something. And how old is your daughter? She's seven. First grade. Okay. First grade. Yeah. You got your hands full. Yeah. Yeah. They're great though. They're great. All right. So based on those answers, I've got, I've got a question. Mm -hmm. You can go see one soft rock performer live. Who would you go see? Paul McCartney. That's not soft. I know that that's not soft rock, but it's from that. It's from that era, right? The sixties. Yeah. Wings. I love. I love Wings. Um, but also, he's getting. He's getting you, on. You in are years, not old you know? enough to know Wings. Oh, you are. I am. No, my parents. <laughs> my dad, in particular, raised me with, with all that stuff. I could. I could sing you the whole Carol King, James Taylor catalog. I've seen Elton John twice live. Uh, oh. oh yeah. No, I'm okay. I'm serious so, about it. Two. Two follow-up questions. Yeah. Are you going to go see Sir Paul in Seattle when he plays? Hey, wait, is he coming? Yeah. Oh, uh, then if you don't know that he's here, you're not getting tickets. Yeah, he's sold out. I, yeah. He's doing. I yeah, mean, he, I've yeah. been a little busy, so I probably yeah, haven't looked. Missed, at the- <laughs> yeah. So yeah, he's coming in May, I think. Oh my gosh, cool. Yeah, he's kicking off his national U.S. national tour in Spokane. Oh my gosh, why is he kicking it off in Spokane? Wow. Cool. No, no, no. Come on. Don't disrespect the east side Spokane of the state. Spokane should be Come very on. excited. 
Oh, they should. I, I tried to get tickets and they were gone. Oh, I mean, man. I, I was, yeah, I tried. Yeah. Um, because when actually the nice thing is we're like, it's the same amount of time to drive to, to Seattle to see a show or Spokane. So I'll, I thought, oh, it'd be easier in Spokane. Yeah. No, I missed. But then Elton John's coming back to the Tacoma Dome. Yeah. He's doing his final farewell tour, right? Right. You the fifth that. version of it or whatever it's going to be. Yeah. 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 Uh, would you go see him? Have you, would you go see him again? No, I think I'm, I think I'm good with, with Elton. I, you know, I saw you him twice. I think I'm, I think I'm all set with him. Um, okay. I would also see James Taylor because I've never seen him live. Uh, okay. And I think he's, I think he's still performing. I think he is. I don't know the answer to that. I think, yeah. I think, I think you're right, but I'm I don't not, know the answer. Yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure, but. And then just, just because this is totally random, but because he just released an album called Sob Rock, John Mayer. Meh. Okay, I just, I just, yeah. I got a kick out of the Sob Rock. It's pretty great. And then, it ha- and then he had the. If you like your your parents may have had the albums that had the nice price sticker on it, which was the the discount sticker back in the seventies. Yeah. So his Sob Rock album has a nice price nice sticker price. on it. Oh, you know, that's yeah. fun. The uh, retro, okay. yeah. The retro, that's fun. Coffee? Are you a coffee fan? Uh, I'm a coffee shop fan. I like the smell of coffee. Coffee okay. bugs my stomach. I can occasionally okay. have cold brew. Okay. Yeah. Tell me a great coffee shop. That I might not know of in the Seattle area. Yeah. Well, like, my where favorite, do you like to go? My favorite okay. is um, it's it's more than a coffee shop. It's a restaurant as well, but Cafe Arta, and it's right next to Third Place Books Ravenna. So it's okay. like a bookstore yep. restaurant kind of yep. in one. But that's that's my favorite. And so as soon as sort of COVID started opening up, I um, I went there and caught up with everybody. I love that place. And is that where you go when you're when you when you visualized working in coffee yeah. shops to write the book? That's it. That's that's, that's, that's where that's I wrote okay. a lot of my Seattle Times columns when I when I was doing that. A lot of my Geekwire columns when I was doing that. Uh, okay. Yeah, and when I would get creatively stuck, I kind of get up, walk around, you know, look at the bookshelves, pick up some things, read some pages, sit back down, and get unstuck. Okay. Where's a great place for lunch? Hmm. Let's see. What's like, what's your food? go-to? What's your go-to food? Go-to food. I really like Indian and Thai. Okay. Um. And you don't drink coffee; it upsets your stomach. But you can eat Indian and Thai food because. Oh they... yeah, very different. Yeah, it's about the no. caffeine. <laughs> it's about the caffeine. Okay. I think. All right. Yeah. So where's a great place for uh, for Indian food in Seattle? Uh, Bengal Tiger is a great place for takeout. Um, okay. We get a lot of Bengal. Yeah, Bengal Tiger was a lot of a lot of COVID. Okay. Uh, a lot of COVID food. <laughs> a lot of COVID food. So yeah, I think okay. that's a good one. Right. And I'm going to wrap this up with my get out of jail free card. Mm-hmm. What didn't I ask you that I should have? What didn't we talk about? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think. I think if if you are done, then we are done. I think I think you. Well, got I mean, it. we could continue this on much longer, but yeah. because you're you're fascinating, I just I think what you what you've written is actually I do have a follow up mm-hmm. question, but I, I think what you've written is very important, and I think people need to to slow down, take the time, and listen to it. I think that's you know, or not listen, but well, maybe is it out on Audible? Yes. Okay, so they could listen yep. to it. There's an audio book covered. So what's next for you is my, my last question. What's next? I mean, there's a lot of work to do at Braver Angels. We've got elections coming up and a lot of heat around the country uh, on that. And uh, people have asked me if I'm going to write another book. I think I'm most certainly going to, but I don't know what about yet. Or I'm, I'm most certainly going to try. I don't know what okay. about yet. There's too many ideas. They have to settle. Uh, yeah. And I don't know. Just you know, trying to enjoy life. <laughs> and enjoy enjoy seeing people again you know i've been going to some house get togethers now and i'm mm-hmm. i'm really excited for that i think that's in some okay. ways the most exciting thing happening all right well, i lied i have one more question because okay. it's about the book tour are you not to put you on the spot because hopefully the answer i'm not trying to get you to are you enjoying going out and meeting people for the book yes it's not terrifying no Okay. You're laughing at me. Like, I've no. seen, for me, it'd be terrifying. I'd be no. terrified no, no. to show up at a. Let, so let me let me say, put it this way: like when I when I travel, and then I come back and I see my kids, I tell them I gotta give you tons of kisses to make up for all the ones I didn't give you, right? right. So this book tour, in a way, it's like 
I'm meeting all the people, all back to back, all these trips that I didn't meet. <laughs> you know? okay. It just feels like, yeah, we got we got some catching up to do. So it is very justified okay. in my mind. So you like the the book too? Yeah. You like yeah. you like it? Oh yeah. No, this was this is an excellent excuse to be <laughs> to be traveling and meeting people and having great conversations. All right. Where would you go if you could book yourself on a, a location for like another stop on the tour? Where would you want to go? Where would I want to go? You know, um, I think it would be neat to find like the most conservative county, the most libertarian county, and the most liberal county and go to all of them. No matter how small they are. Because usually book tours are big cities, but whatever, right? But you, but you have the data. You can find. I could that find that out. Right? Yeah. In fact, I think I'm going to look it up because that sounds kind of awesome. Well, I think it would be very interesting to see and document it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I like that because because the book's neutral. Mm-hmm. It's honest it's neutral. about my own politics. Sure. But I I tr- I tried as hard as I could to um, yeah. to try as best as I could to put myself in the minds of folks who I know and have interviewed and, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, see the world very different ways. I think actually, I think that's really cool that if you could, if you could do that, um, that would be not, not for me to tell you what to do, but you should do that. Yeah. I think I should do that too. (laughs) It's a great idea. Thanks Scott. Yeah. I'm here to help. (laughs) Well, Monica, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this and I'm looking forward to following along and seeing I know you've got another book in you. I, I can just tell. And um, I'm looking forward to it. I bet it comes out sooner rather than later. I bet one of these days you're going to sit up in bed at 3 a.m. and go, ah, that's it. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. And I hope so. That sounds like the best way to yeah. come up with a book idea. Yeah, I bet you do. Yeah. So cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. See you next time. Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.